All right, hello everyone and welcome to today's event, a uh, discussion on energy efficiency measurement and verification in 2020. My name is Fred Thwaites and I'm the secretary of the NorCal chapter of the Association of Energy Engineers. We're very excited to have a true expert in m and with us today, Steve Cromer. Uh, Steve is an energy efficiency consultant who is focused on energy savings verification and energy efficiency data management systems. Previously, Mr. Cromer was a senior engineer at the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. He consults for a wide range of clients around the world. Mr. Cromer was one of the initial developers of what is now the IPMVP, the International Performance Measurement and Verification Protocol. He is an experienced instructor and a trainer in M&V for AEE and various other clients. And he's the current chairman of AEE's Certified M&V Professional Board. Mr. Cromer is a licensed professional engineer and holds a bachelor's in mechanical engineering from Virginia Tech. After Mr. Cromer's presentation, we'll move on to Q&A uh, with questions from the audience. So please use the chat feature to send your questions directly to me at that time. All right, Steve, I'll turn it over to you. Great, uh, Fred, I'm here, here I am, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Great. Well, welcome, everybody. Thanks, Fred, for the introduction. Thanks, Tim. Thanks to the whole NorCal chapter for holding this. Uh, I am Steve Cromer. I'm sitting in Berkeley, California right now, just down the hill from Lawrence Berkeley Lab, where I'm still a guest researcher. And I used to be the vice chair, the vice president and the treasurer at our local AEE chapter here. And I think the last time I gave a talk to an AEE chapter, um, I talked about M&V, and it was probably 1995, and I gave it using an overhead projector and uh, you know, down at the, the, the faculty club here on campus at the University of California. So uh, your, your comment about time kind of hits me there, Tim. Uh, how did I spend these 25 years? You know, what, what did I get out of it, right? And the thing was, at Lawrence Berkeley, we ran a pilot program uh, on performance contracting. So we are energy engineers, facility managers at the site. It's what I love about AEE and these chapters is we've all mostly are on the ground in the world doing things for real. And of course, at, at Berkeley, we had a, a chance to do the pilot program for something called performance contracting, which is a specific financial and legal construct to quantifying, uh, in which you quantify the results of the implementation of measures. And it's that the product of that whole deal is this absence of savings, right? And it was new to me because we'd, we'd done, I'd done plenty of work in facilities, uh, didn't say it on my resume, but I used to work at Enron as well. Uh, I used to work doing field work, installing metering across the Northwest and are actually around the country. Um, but I didn't really know how you valued the product of our work. We know energy efficiency is valuable, but how much? So this was a chance at Berkeley to, uh, to do a pilot program. And we actually had to learn uh, how to quantify energy efficiency. And that led to, and you can uh, keep, get the slides going. Um, do I just uh, cue you like that, Fred? Just say move ahead or can I push the button somehow? I'll do it for you. I just uh, okay. was on the wrong window. There you go. All right. Okay, so what happened was we, we developed some tools for the Federal Energy Management Program. We were asked to do that as part of the in-house program at Berkeley. And it just uh, simultaneously, coincidentally in 1992, uh, the, the world had changed to some degree with uh, Clinton getting in and there was a new push for performance contracting. So there was a big thirst around the US and the country then for a common set of protocols to perform this magical art of quantifying the absence of energy. So um, again, the challenge has been there for a long time, ever since there's been energy efficiency programs and ever since energy has been consumed, people have thought about being efficient and then trying to quantify how, how well they did their work. So uh, again, that's at, at Berkeley where we started to generate these standard tools. And uh, that's what the IPMVP came out of. Uh, it's where we classified and specified what M and B means under different contexts. And that's now 25, 26 years ago that was started and the document's still out there. And as we've just mentioned, you can go around the world and, and any one of 10,000 people that have been certified in M&V as CMVPs, well, you can converse with them and you can talk about the options that are available to you. And that's, so what happened in 25 years ago is we codified you know, judgment and standard judgment and 25 years later, that's still what's required. Again, what I like about AEE and CMVPs is all the scientists, all the king's horses, all the king's men, all the brilliant people in all the research institutions haven't figured out 
how to quantify energy efficiency in buildings where things change, where there's adjustments that need to be made over time. So you're, uh, everyone here is gonna be continue to be valuable. Every CMVP out there is valuable. If we want energy efficiency to work, this set of skills is really important. So this talk is really gonna be about what's changed in those 25 years, what's evolved, uh, what hasn't changed, and just from the viewpoint of someone who kind of has been along for the ride, and I'll say, you know, give credit to all the, the, the I'm standing on the shoulders of giants in so many ways, whether it's Steve Schiller out here, who was doing a lot of this work in California then, whether it's the Energy Systems Lab down in Texas, the folks out in New Jersey, lots of people around the world now. Uh, there's so many people that are contributing to this art and this science uh, and, and will continue to. Um, so it's really fun to be among them and, and sort of watch how things change. So we're going to talk about the new sources of data, uh, the new modeling tools. Nick, you know, I'm happy you're here because, um, and I was happy to see eQuest invitation because it's always been sort of, you know, an outlier in our world is how do you actually use energy models realistically in real buildings, not just as comparators for code compliance, but in real buildings. And we're getting there. You know, we are definitely getting there. And there's so many more, not just places where energy models are useful, but where you really need them because we got this challenge where the, the time of day when you save energy now is just as important as how much you save. So you've got to know hourly when those savings are happening to be important to be uh, able to interact with a grid, which is so rapidly evolving. So at least on three levels we're changing and that's the data collection, the modeling, and then the whole grid itself. And what we're going to talk about is how M and V is evolving to match that. So again, um, let's go to the next slide. Uh, if you do a Google search on M&V under images, uh, who hasn't done that recently? Uh, you have this funny thing where you see um, the line on the left where it kind of it kind of goes up and down, has peaks and valleys or volatility. And on the right, it goes down and then there's some difference. And you know, you can look at that from a scientific viewpoint and think it's complicated or it does get complicated when you get into the, the detailed lines. Um, but actually it's a really, really simple concept that IPMVP is based on. And, and that is, as many of you know, that you can establish, that it is possible to establish in a period of time before you inter institute your, your retrofit, the operating performance of a system, a house, a building, a facility, an, a, a campus. You can, you, can, you can codify that, you can standard, you can uh, um, calculate, you can actually just collect that information and create a model which will allow you to predict what's gonna happen in the future with that facility. So the baseline, is a period of time where you can collect the operation and codify it and use that in the future. M and V is the process of collecting that data and running that model. But what it requires is that that baseline be relevant to the future. That the conditions under which you're operating your building now are somehow fair and accurate and transparent comparator in the future. And that's the big challenge. So the really, really simple method is take some data, uh, build a model that you can use in the future that everyone agrees is fair and accurate. Um, next slide, please. Um, again, going back just a little bit in the history of, of then, again, M and V as an art and a science on its own, you know, what, what, what really pushed us and what's pushing us now? So this evolution, of course, started uh, sort of prior to my, not, not much prior, but prior to my career. In the early 70s and in late 70s, we had the oil shocks. And if you look at the history out here in California with uh, Art Rosenfeld, if those of you that know him at Lawrence Berkeley Lab, and the beginnings of the Cal California Energy Commission, and the development of an entire infrastructure in our society to identify and harvest, collect, uh, and, 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 and um, value, value and collect savings, right? Energy efficiency. So a lot of that was pushed when we were freaked out and scared that we weren't going to have enough fuel. Um, so the 70s was different. You know, energy prices for, had been relatively flat. Suddenly they spiked, um, and we were all looking at something to do. So that's when you know there was a big push to begin an industry called performance contracting, energy efficiency, blah, blah, blah. That went along for about 10 or 15 years. And then the second big shock was this deregulation shock. So those of you in California remember this really well. Uh, we said, okay, it's, you know, we kind of stabilized and actually energy efficiency was doing pretty well. And now we wanted to re restructure our energy systems such that third parties could come in and deliver and generate electrons, put them on a wire and you could buy them from anybody. So the deregulation push was there and co coincident with that, uh, the, the regulators and the, and the legislature wanted to invest in as much efficiency for the entire society as we could. So we came up with um, energy efficiency as a resource on the statewide and national level, not so much national, that's it's still starting to happen, but at least statewide, we put a lot of resources into 
how many power plants can we avoid building if we run programs? How many gigawatts can we not generate? Which was somewhat, you know, it's still, it seems normal to us out here. That's still kind of a wild idea to people around the world. Like you're gonna pay people not to do something and not to build energy, but it made sense from the, you know, any number of reasons for under the um, deregulation area. Of course, um, you know, full disclosure, I did work at Enron. I thought things weren't going pretty well, but, um, you know, the corporate masters didn't. And uh, some of the guys in the financial suite were doing some tricky stuff. I don't think they should have gone to zero, but they went to zero. Enron's gone. And, um, you know, it's, it's a memory. I had a lot of good, I, good friends still I work with there. And I think it was a really good experience. Uh, we're, and we're all still out here, right? There's actually a lot of, 20 years later, a lot of stuff happening that sounds a lot like what we were doing at Enron. Okay, that's the second shock. The, the shock that's happening now uh, is gonna be probably even more, more disorienting to M&V folks. Oh, oh, by the way, the deregulation shock is where M&V really came in with the utility program evaluation. So um, they started looking at across the board, these programs were running in the state of California and around the country, and how are we evaluating on them, which sounds a lot like M&V, but has some different constructs. All right, so then we have grid management now is, is what's happened most recently. Um, the, the grid itself is changing, uh, the duck curves, PVs, uh, you know, energy coming in. We have EVs for energy in our cars. Uh, th there's not, no such thing as a stable baseline anymore. We have things like population analytics, NMEC, non-routine adjustments is now required because everyone wants to use the automated meter infrastructure. So um, from an MV perspective, you know, it's a, it's a holy grail for a consultant because there's so much to think about. Uh, but from someone planning all this, it's, it's confusing and the language is getting a little contorted. And then of course, in the last year, we've had the greatest non-routine adjustment event of all time, which is our whole economy has just changed. I mean, you walk out the door and it's quiet on Wednesday. And it didn't used to be. And there's only 200,000 cars going down I-80, not 400,000. And you know everything's changed, right? So what does a stable baseline mean under these conditions? Okay, at this rate, we're gonna be on for three hours. So Fred, uh, we'll have to pick it up. There you go. All right, so, and then you have people like our good friend over at Recurve saying, guess what? Uh, this whole new change has done so much to the industry that a traditional m and is obsolete. So here's some scare tactics thrown into the world to, to get you guys, whoa, what do you mean? You know, I just paid 1500 bucks for my CMVP class. What do you mean um, everything I'm learning is not relevant anymore? To which I would say, and I'm just looking at the laughter in some of your faces, yeah, that's not exactly true. This is a marketing strategy. It's, it's kind of true that classic m and has to adjust. It's, I believe it's even more important, and I'm, of course, I'm directly involved here. It's more important that people understand what m and and IPMVP really is why retrofit isolation can be a really good uh, backup if you can't use the automated meter infrastructure, things like that. So being conversant in IPMVP fundamentals is more important. So traditional m and and the concepts haven't changed. Uh, they're still really important to, to be able to implement uh, projects in the going forward. Next slide. But um, there are some really cool things developing that COVID's developed, which is if you wanna compare your building to others, um, how do you do that? And so, uh, Again, Recurve and others have come up with Gridium, a neighbor down here in Silicon Valley, have come up with tools to let you uh, test your building against a whole suite of other buildings, even um, sampled and um, stratified sampling for how does my building do against its, its peers. So peer uh, comparison groups are co coming up. Those can be really useful to augment uh, the, the before and after in your own building. So a lot of great stuff happening. Next slide. All right, so again, I, I'd like to throw in the pitch here, again, as a, as a general um, situation in, in for an AEE uh, Wednesday night class, you know, kind of, uh, you know, throw, throw in something softball or side, side ball, whatever. <laughs> you know, you know I, I watched, I listened to this podcast last year, and those of you that know Michael Lewis, he wrote Moneyball, Liars Poker, The Big Short. He's a great writer, and he writes about all kinds of cool stuff. Well, if you generally like his, his shtick, this podcast is great if you're an m and person, especially because it's all about um, what, who are the people that are in between deals? Who are the people that are in between mediating truth? You know, judges, referees, uh, um, uh, you know, on the, on the floor, the stock market, who's, who's doing the regulating of that? And, you know, there's challenges in every one of these situations. Finding truth and arbitrating between contentious people is always hard. And I feel like you listen to this and every one of these uh, episodes has something where it kind of resonates with an M&V person. We're asked to come in between contentious folks and identify what truth people are bringing to the table because when they leave and they exchange money, they have to agree. 
right? The, the whole thing about energy efficiency is when you're doing it as a business, the final product is going to be is going to be um, arbitrated in dollar value, and people have to feel comfortable. They're getting a good deal, and they're and they're giving they're paying for what they got. So we're setting up the rules to run that equation, and then, and then this is just a really good. Uh, Reminder that everyone else in our economy has really similar problems, to tell you the truth. Legal, financial, engineering, all those things overlap in a lot of other part, other industries. So next slide. Go listen to that one. So back to where we started. 25 years ago, the world was a little simpler in that uh, it was a North American energy measurement and verification protocol. Um, we had uh, the energy shocks had happened and we were looking for ways to quantify so we could just use less uh, effectively. I'll say the, the genesis of this document was in large part uh, guided by the folks down at Texas A&M and ASHRAE, where they had uh, a pretty good structure saying retrofit isolation, whole building measurement, even calibrated simulation was part of their suite of tools. Uh, they didn't call it option A, B, C, and D, and they never had option A. <laughs> Frankly, uh, you can either thank or blame Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory for that. Because we said, great, um, you guys, you know, B, C, and D are all cool. But anybody that knows the ASHRAE guideline 14 knows it's got requirements. It says to comply with ASHRAE, you have to have certain things done, which means you are on the hook to spend a certain amount of money for every project if you want to comply. And that just isn't going to cut it in, in, in any, almost any small deal and most medium sized deals. You can't just afford to do a research level M&B project on every project. The business won't prosper. So, you know, any MVP was a, as a, um, an agreement, collaboration, a negotiated settlement among the parties that were doing M&B at the time. And we came up with you know, option A as well as the uh, retrofit isolation for, for um, B, continuous measurement, C, whole building, and D, statistical, I mean, D, um, physical modeling. Uh, what, what I still think is pretty um, significantly uh, interesting, important, consoling, is that we got it right enough back then and again, I'd stand on the shoulders of giants at Texas A&M and Energy Systems Lab, they had it right, uh, um, that these really are the, the major con constituents of what you need in an m and protocol. You need to either isolate or measure the whole building. You need to do it um, either continuously from a statistical standpoint with data you already have, or you need to be able to build a physical model. So these are those kind of things they got right. What we have now is, is evolved. So recent measurements, recent moves in California, New York, other places where they're, they're moving back to this option C approach under pay for performance programs, that's NMEC. And we'll talk about that a little later, but this is where it all started 25 years ago. So next slide, please. All right, so a couple of years ago, I think it's 20, 2016, this is looking forward, the California legislature got involved. Those of you in California might know that the programs out here at a billion dollars a year are significant, right? The investments that we, the money we collect out of our, um, our utility user base, our customers, is on the, on the, around a billion dollars a year. And we pump that back into programs to accomplish our goals. And our main goals have been, you know, not building power plants, they avoided costs there, but now they're also climate goals. So, uh, you know, the, the, the myriad, and sophisticated, the numerous things that this requires when you take a billion dollars out of the economy and put it back in somewhere else in a regulated environment meant that we had to develop baselines that um, said, well, you don't wanna double, double pay the utilities. If they have codes and standards they've already implemented, you don't wanna give them credit a second time for putting the stuff in right. So a bunch of weird stuff had to get developed around the baselines. It got really complicated. Uh, keeping it short, you know, people, People that weren't happy with all that complication, and they pushed something through a couple of years ago uh, that initially had this language about um, you know you should use IPMVP in it, which again was a tip of the hat to the fact that IPMVP had much of the constituent framework you might need to develop a a real quote unquote M and system that wasn't dependent on code baselines that was actually um, build uh, business as usual or. Um, as, 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 the, as the building was using energy before as the baseline, not some weird made up baseline. Sorry, I'll get that word later when it comes to me. The point being, the legislature got involved. When the legislature gets involved in a technical issue, look out, <laughs> right? Because they, de they define something called NMEX. So you can go to the next slide. And, and NMEC, okay, I'll leave NMEC uh, is still being arbitrated as to what it actually means. So we'll talk about that a little later. 
But again, let's go into the challenge uh, from the utility program side. So again, as, as IPMBP was developed and put out there, it was assumed it could be used in many different settings. And just going back to the fundamentals, the, the core process in IPMBP is that it is possible to take some period of time on the left here under that wavy dotted line, which has peaks and valleys, you can rationalize those peaks and valleys into a, into a model such that you can draw that red line on the right with confidence by all parties. You can create a comparator in the future, which everyone will agree is what would have happened. That's the counterfactual argument in a nutshell. So our whole method was basically based on compared to what, what would have happened meter. So if you can co convince yourselves and everyone in your, in your parties, all the parties attended to your deal, that you can develop a model that will give an accurate and relevant comparator in the future, that's what this is based on. And in many cases, this is true. Let's go to the next slide. But there's another way of doing it. So uh, this modeling yourself against yourself is called in the world words of the uh, Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory uh, Energy Information Handbook, which I highly recommend if you can see these slides later and do that link, it's really cool. It's called longitudinal benchmarking. So not to throw too much more language in, but comparing yourself to yourself over time is longitudinal benchmarking. How was I doing before? How am I doing now? How does that compare to what's actually happening? So that's great. That's another way of saying what IPMVP is, um, longitudinal benchmarking. The other way you can go into the scientific inquiry is you can compare yourself to others. And who does that? Well, control groups, right? So with um, drug testing, with any number of other scientific studies, they do a comparison to others using control groups. And that's called cross-sectional benchmarking. How am I doing compared to others? That's long been used in program evaluation and it's coming back now because of COVID. So we'll talk about that. So again, when IPMBP came out, we just did the compared to um, yourself, but now we're looking at comparing yourself to others. How are other buildings relate, uh, re reacting to COVID versus mine? Were they given uh, uh, retrofits or not? And how does that compare? So that's one thing that's changed. The next slide, please. The other thing is, you remember when you, when you take M and B generally and you say option C, and then you go, well, but what if I'm applying that in the utility program? These are the other things that utility programs and the regulators are all concerned about. Uh, they don't wanna hand out money and incentives to run programs back to people that were already gonna do the work. So the baselines in these cases, they don't wanna reward you if you should have had um, taken your incandescent lights out 10 years ago, they don't wanna reward you now. So they'll adjust your baseline based on that. So there's a numerous, again, these sophisticated techniques that, that the evaluators come up with to, a, to address whether you've actually should be rewarded uh, not compared to what you were using exactly, but compared to what you should have been using. So that's the next slide, please. So I just I think it's useful to remember the second type of baseline that we need to consider in M and D is what should have happened meter, and that that can be a different baseline than what than what would have happened, and that's confusing for some CMVPs who've never been exposed to the full uh, full chaos of utility program evaluation on top of um, you know say performance contracting evaluation. So that's a challenge we've had to live with in M&B, speaking both these languages across these worlds and informing everyone. Because a lot of people now in the utility world say, yeah, I'm doing option C. And you go, well, no, no, you not really are. You aren't because you're not doing a number of things that um, utility programs still require. So the what should have happened meter just says you'd compare not to what that building would have done, but what it, how it should have been working, which opens up a whole other thing, which is are these buildings operating to code in general, and now with COVID, how is that going to change? How you know? I don't know if you guys are all following what ASHRAE is doing. I just keep a little bit, but um, you know, we're going to have to put in high efficiency filters now, right? And that's going to change fan energy. We're going to have to run more outside air. It's going to change. I mean, building operations are going to change compared to our stable baseline. All that's going to have an impact. How are we going to quantify that? How are we going to calculate savings when the whole operation of our building? That that's nothing to do with the schedule stuff. Right, which is the 85% of the restaurants in downtown San Francisco are now defunct. I just read an hour ago. I mean, you know, everything's up for grabs right now. So our classic M and B method is under attack, if not, um, you know, extinct. So compared to, to compared to what? This should also, Nick, you should smile at this one. This is where the, the simulation modeling really comes in, right? When you want to build a baseline of what should have happened and make um, changes to what would happen if that building had been using different pieces of equipment. The simulation engine is really the way to go. So you can poo-poo it and say it's not ready for prime time because you can't calibrate them and they're hard to use. 
But when you want to compare it to what to what should have happened, you really need one, and it can be done effectively. So um, next slide, please. All right. So the other thing that's influencing the world is uh, you know just the the uh, these the grids changing quickly. Not you know we can. Um, Use your imagination. The solar coming in, uh, wind, gen who's what's, what the generation is on the grid, the operations, wind energy, electric vehicles, all these things are making um, the energy going into any one building or coming out change in, in real time. So we'll leave that as, um, except for to say, that, of course, we also have the Global uh, Warming Solutions Act of 2006, the SB 350, 2015, and more stuff coming on integrating our energy infrastructure into our climate approach, right? So all this is going to be challenging our, our model of how energy is being used and how we do baselines. So next slide. All right, so those of you that remember the IP MVP uh, or ever took the class, it, it gave us a, fr a flexible framework. And we were, we were actually a attacked for that early on, that we didn't give enough specificity, that we didn't tell people how to do it. In my mind, it was always the case that IP MVP would be a framework and a toolkit that required careful use by individuals and a lot of judgment calls. And I'm teaching the class this week. And what I tell all the students is, and there are some cases in the, in the conduct of M&V where any two people should get the same answer. I don't know if, take, Tim, you took the class last fall, uh, especially in the stats part, you know, descriptive statistics. If I give you all 10 numbers and ask for an average, you should get the same answer. If I give you all, uh, you know, 24 data points for 12 months of data and 12 and HD, heating degree days, you should get the same R squared, the same slope and intercept. But if I give you 8,760 points until you build a model, every one of you might get a slightly different model. You might put your in, you know, inflection points in different places and you're gonna use judgment, which means I might get at this point to 32 different answers for the same problem. And they're all correct. And that's a challenge, right, for M&V. You know, it requires judgment. And that's what IPMVP is founded on, that it, it just requires judgment. It's still somewhat of an art. That's not even talking about simulation engines when you have 10,000 variables that might vary a little bit depending on who built the model. All right, so we know it's a framework. We know that we know though ever more, more than ever that when you go around the world, that framework and that simple language, it allows people to go from zero, maybe not to a hundred like a Tesla, uh, but zero to 60 or 80, you know, really quickly. They can, they can have meaningful conversations about their approach to quantify energy efficiency between New Zealand, Singapore, India, UAE, wherever you guys are in the world, you can talk this language and, and really jump over most of the hurdles that have stood in the way historically about what your approach is gonna be and how you're gonna apply it. So um, that's why it's still lived for 25 years. Fundamental, it, it reflects the fact that you have to collect data from the field at some level. And we didn't put it in the title in m and we should have called it m, m and v Measurement Modeling and Verification. It is based on building either a statistical or physical model with the data we collect. All right, so that's still the foundation. Foundation is still out there. Next slide. Um, problem is now we got a lot more data. So if you read the uh, you know the chat the little comic here, um, you know more data can be great, right? Uh, more data is now available at every level, but is anybody really making good decisions with it? And you know the, the trick is Silicon Valley and, and all my neighbors down here across the, in the West Bay and South Bay are paying a lot of money to hire smart people to do machine learning and AI. Uh, give me a ton of data and I'll tell you something, right? Well, that's, that's okay, um, but we need to do better than that because if we have, everyone has their own answer, we can't build a business. So we need to standardize to some degree. So, that, so there's a lot of data available. We know that, next slide. And, and you know, it, it's, if you're again, an energy engineer, like probably all of us are, um, don't know if you ever go to this site, but you can look at the US energy demand on a national level now, right? You can see 500, 600 uh, gigawatt hours being, or big gigawatts in real time. It's pretty cool. I mean, this has all changed in 25 years where I can look at real time meter for the US. You know? That's pretty fun stuff. Next slide. Or I can just dive into California. And we've all, we've all probably familiar with the KISO site out here in California where you can get on your, on your laptop, on your phone and watch in real time what the grid's doing. And you can be proud that at any given time and that when it's sunny in the summer, there might be 11 now gigawatts of solar power on, on our grid. I mean, it's incredible. You could actually run California on solar uh, some of the time almost if you, you know, cut off your ancillary loads. So um, this is what's happening and all this data is available. And then the next one um, is, you know, home energy management. So uh, that's, you know, that, that 
thing with these slides is what I get with my rainforest networks um, meter here. I can look at my own home meter and watch it happen. And um, so next slide or push the button and see if that one's animated. Okay, so what we have is we have information in load shapes now at three different levels. And so here we are inundated with data. Um, we have you know, the, the national data, of course, has a nice smooth slope. The state has a more of a little more jagged, but it's fairly smooth. But in the household level, it's all over the place. So when you start getting this granular data, it may sound good, but pretty soon you're looking at, well, I can't really correlate to outdoor weather because I ran my dishwasher and my clothes washer and my dryer twice today, but for the rest of the week, nothing. So I don't get any good correlations at the daily level, but maybe at the weekly level or at an aggregate level, I start to. So all this data can be useful, but we gotta be smart about how we bring it together. And that's a real challenge to our classic method. So next slide. Um, so more data is interesting. More data can be analyzed in more ways. There are numbers, tools out there. I just you know make the sales pitch. So no one gets paid for it for eCam. It's a great tool people are using to start navigating. How many ways can you model 87, 60 points? You know, it's a lot. And any two of you might get a slightly different answer. And of course, eCam, if you're familiar, um, uses the uh, inverse modeling toolkit from ASHRAE. So it's got a great pedigree. It's also IP MVP compliant. Um, so it's, it's free and open source, and so it's repeatable and transparent. Um, so yeah, when you start going into this world to analyze 8760 or more granular data, these are the kind of tools we want to use. The Universal Translator, for those of you that know PG&E, um, ho helped host that and state, I think, paid for it. It's really cool as well. But there's numerous other ones. LBL has R code, NMECR from KW. The time wicket temperature model is a new way of taking advanced look at or a detailed look at, at the uh, interval meter data that's now available. That's backwards, so next slide. Okay, and then next slide. Okay, but here's here's the, here's the where IP MVP got its start, All right? So, you know, we, we started the concept is I can take something like 24 data points over a slightly different range of days. So waiting is a little bit important, but you know, there's not a whole lot of noise on a monthly bill. And if I roll them up against, in this case, heating degree days, and if I get that kind of an R squared, I'm pretty comfortable. That's a pretty good model, right? Uh, 12 data points, and it's easy to understand. The concept is easy, easy to understand for everyone. Energy goes along, goes down, middle of the year, goes back up for whatever reason. It's related to weather. This makes sense. There's an intercept, there's a slope. Okay, that's classic M and V. And this is still conceptually the model, but let's go to the next slide. With 8760 though, we, <laughs> we don't get that nice smooth line. We get that incredibly jagged line in the upper right. We have way more records than we can put on any 12 screens in front of you, right? So I call big data anything I can't see or, or like cognate in one thing. If it can be 200 data points. That's big data because I can't see it and figure it out. I got I to gotta start doing analytics on it. So um, this is what 8760 gives you. Sure, you have interval meter data and you have that data cloud in the lower right. What do you do with that? It looks like there's something that's correlated in one dimension, but not in the other. It's just, you know, it can be, okay, this is not your dad's or your grandfather's M and V problem. Next slide. <coughs> so um, the, the question is, if you saw this, do you see a correlation? And, uh, you know, the answer is, yeah, sort of, but I have to break it up a little bit. I need to know when those points are happening. I always teach in the class, you know, being an M&V person, you have to look at data uh, from at least three different viewpoints. You have to look at the tables of data, the XY plot, and then the time series. And you have to be able to go back and forth between all three to really understand what's happening. So when you look at this, this is of course an XY plot with the X axis being probably average outdoor temperature. And there's some regimes there where that's not influencing energy use. That's probably when it's not occupied. And there is a period when, with that hourly data, when there is a clear correlation between temperature um, and so you kind of can imagine there's models within this. Next slide. And how many models? Well, some people can take that and break it down by hour now and say, actually, there's a lot of really good models in there. On any given hour of the day, I can draw a model that matches that pretty well. And if you look at those orange ones in the bottom row, pretty much, you have might, well, actually, all of them might have multiple slopes. So there might be a flat area of a uh, 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 up slope and then another flat slope or any number of, of, of um, segments within that data. With 8760, you know, if you, you only need six, seven, eight or nine data points to start to draw a curve, you can break up the, uh, the whole year like this. And if you do it intelligently, you can get good correlations and you can start to model occupied, unoccupied and every hour of the day. So really powerful, 
you know, when it works. Right? Uh, this, is what's, this is what's available. This is what's changed since we started the IP MVP. Next slide. Um, you know, again, Ecamm does this for you. You can start to look at typical load shapes and see, all right, what was the load shape before and after on a typical day average? This is really powerful if your m and is, um, if you've got someone that says, I'm gonna save you 30% you know, savings on your building, what you can do is overlay a load shape and say, when? What hour of the day am I gonna see those savings? I've used this in Saudi Arabia on a building at Saudi, you know, we have a lot of facilities that are basically 24 seven because the heating loads don't go down that much at night. Um, but they were, they were predicting 30% uh, savings. And I said, great, just show me the typical load shape before and what you predict for, to get 30% savings. And for and one week after your retrofit, I should be able to see if you're meeting those savings at night. All right, so getting this interval meter data is really important to developing these load shapes. Next slide. All right, so that, that kind of um, encapsulates some of the opportunities we're seeing with, with, um, with the statistical data. And again, option, you know, option A, B and C, in IPMVP, rely on the idea that you have data about the baseline period. And using that data, you can build a model as we just saw. Option D uh, was, re was reserved for those situations where either you did not have baseline data because the building wasn't built and you were gonna have to build a model afterwards and then make, make the adjustments. Or even if you had uh, baseline data and you could build a model and you wanted to make more articulated adjustments in the ongoing period. So it, this was not part of the original NEMVP. There actually were only three options, A, B, and C. It was a, a negotiated settlement, so to speak. People were so mad about having option A, they forced us to put option D in. And for the like 15 years, we never used it. Very few people used option D. I want Nick to like argue about this later, whether it's possible to do M and V with uh, simulation models. But what's really happened in the last, you know, I'd say five, six, seven, eight years, largely through Open Studio, also with eQuest though and the eQuest users group. Uh, there's communities of people out there like the eQuest users group that are much more conversant in the challenges of getting real models applied to real buildings. And I'll say that again, uh, from, from my perspective for the longest time, these, these models, simulation models were used to do comparisons uh, between uh, a, a, a prototype model or a, a typical situation for, for comparative analysis, what would happen if I change these parameters? They weren't intended to actually relate to real buildings. But a lot of that's changed. And with better physics modeling, option D uh, and calibration, you now we can use these models in M and V a lot more effectively. And the main point is it's cost effectively. Um, it's, you're able to do it. You're able to afford to do this because people are up the learning curve and can, can collect the data build these models quickly and, and up, upgrade them quickly. So um, critical when you're comparing to code because you, have to, you don't have a real building with code, you have to see what would have happened uh, comparing to industry standard or any number of uh, features and, and kind of conduct of M&V, having a, sim a good simulation engine can be your best friend. And fortunately, this is, this is what's happening. We're seeing a, a lot of development here, um, improvements. Um, Non-routine adjustments, we're gonna talk about a little bit I still think this is the biggest opportunity for you guys in the modeling world. Get involved with how you can use, combine with the fault detection, anomaly detection folks. Uh, this data science stuff is only gonna go for so far. They can tell you something happened. They can tell you when there's an anomaly, they can't tell you why. They don't have the detailed information on the underlying systems. They need something like this where you can show them, all right, what was the system impact at a, at a physical level? and then match that up with the non-routine adjustment. This is what's really gonna be important to help you know, keep energy efficiency in the forefront going forward. All right, so um, prototype models are out there in large numbers. That just means models that are pretty good and pretty close to your typical building. It gives you a way to do a, an order of magnitude estimate of the impact. So if you do a lighting retrofit, how much does it impact your chiller, retro, your chiller plant and your HVAC in climate zone four? in California, you know, in a, in a commercial building, things like that. So a lot of uses for that are better than and, and more e easily usable than they were when IPMVP was invented. Next slide. Try and be respectful of time. I think we're doing okay. All right. Um, so it, on the level that option D stuff I actually was uh, brought in to do an m and analysis for the general simulation industry. And we generated this report, which you can find the link last year. PSD Consulting was the main contractor to Department of Energy. And it was how are simulation engines being used in general and utility programs across the country? And the answer was, there's still a lot of custom work out there. People are going to eQuest users group, figuring out how to do it, generating their own custom workflow 
and it's good enough for ComEd or ConEd or Austin or uh, Austin Energy or, or Virgins or whatever up in Vermont. Um, there's not a single standard for this right now. That's, that's kind of the status quo. So I'd still look for more standardization to come out of that. To get that done in California, if you're involved in this, this uh, Cal BEM is the most recent version of a, a informal users group. Um, and this is like the third or fourth iteration of different folks getting together on a regular basis to, to solve this problem, which I told Fred, you know, we would talk a little bit about California specific. Um, I, I was on a consultant team for the UC Merced, which is a greenfield phase two development of a new campus. And they're building 13 new buildings. And uh, we brought in a lot, a, a big chunk of the simulation modeling industry to help us out out there in the form of building five different models for every building. So whether it was a lead, a lead model, a code compliance model, a performance model, um, a, a, a model for savings by design. And then the fifth one, I'm not remembering, but I remember it seemed in, pretty incredible to me. It was like uh, that we would be doing five separate models for every building out there. And that's kind of a general challenge. These programs all got thrown out. Um, Cal BEM is trying to help integrate. How do you do energy modeling cradle to cradle through the life of a project so that you do the model once Granted that there's different needs for these models over time, but how do we make it more effective so that we can only build, we only have to build a model once and we can have different use cases? Um, trying to get some standardization around that. That'll really help the MNV world. All right, next slide. All right, so um, final thing about disrupting, that's data, that's energy models, and then the grid itself is just changing really fast. Um, Renewables are coming on, we know that. We have 11 to 12 gigawatts now of solar in the middle of the day or renewables plus wind. Um, prices on the grid are going negative, we'll talk about that. And the whole concept of energy efficiency as a resource within this changing grid is what's up for grabs. What's really challenging the, the classic IPMBP methodology. So next slide. Um, you know, the duck curve, if you haven't heard about it, is this phenomenon where the, the grid has to react to the middle of the day uh, not much demand for the carbon generating uh, base load because there's so much power coming in from solar energy and wind. But at the end of the day, which is the head of the duck on the right of that diagram on the left, is when the sun goes down and suddenly there's this huge surge and everything has to ramp up. And for the most part, that's a lot of dirty power. So the duck curve um, gives us, it, it really makes the job of the ISO difficult, California Independent System Operator. Uh, and it does this weird thing where um, it kind of, pollutes or converts or corrupts pricing. So next slide. So what we have is, you know, all of us that are committed to, as Tim said, in, in our industry and AEE and elsewhere, understanding how energy is used in buildings and trying to squeeze out the most value for every uh, kilowatt or, or therm we put in or a piece of steam or whatever um, and get as productive as we can. So productivity, uh, for the lowest carbon input. You know, all these things are just a fascinating challenge for our economy and for our individual buildings. But for the most part, we've, had to, we've been able to say, all right, when we do our work and we're done, it's valuable. And it's valuable as measured through, uh, did I reduce the energy load on the building? And so how much did I save in dollars? Well, it turns out the wholesale is sending signals now. Let's go to the next slide um, where, uh, when the grid is overloaded with free power, so to speak, from solar, they'll push that power out to you. And if you had a battery, they would pay you to take it off the grid. It's called a negative price. And that's not percolating through rates yet, but this is a, like the reality of how we are having to manage our whole grid, our whole supply system. So if we're gonna have a grid, we're gonna have to manage it. We're gonna have to look at what's efficiency worth when I'm saving energy when they really want me to burn more of it. And how does that affect my MNV? How does that affect my baseline when I, you know, there's negative prices. We have to be con conversant with this. Just saying I saved 10,000 kilowatt hours last month is not good enough anymore. Again, why we need simulation models that are able to look at 8760 and show what our impacts are gonna be, our load impacts over time. Next slide. All right, so um, we have to move to hourly reporting. You know, this monthly reporting is, is was good enough, but in the new world, it's not gonna be. So we have to be prepared and learn and teach each other how to do that. Uh, savings has to be demonstrated at definitely an hourly or even sub hourly level. So we're gonna to have to develop our tools to do that. Um, next slide, in the interest of time. So um, that's kind of, I guess the major challenges I see uh, to our classic method. Uh, what we, you know, Evo itself as the efficiency evaluation organization 
mainly a bunch of volunteers with a few employees that have uh, update the materials that allow us to, um, to perform, to teach each other how this stuff works. So it's open for all of you to, to join and contribute. And, um, and, and some of the products they came out with recently, one of them was this tool testing lab where you could take any model you want and run it against some standard data and see how your model compares to others. That's worked pretty well. I, I still think there's some challenges with having multiple models out there. Um, in an NMEC world, I think it's better to have a standard model like a Caltrack or an open EE meter where everyone agrees it's not perfect, but it's a standard model. It's good enough. It uses a, a known technology, a standard model. You, there's, not, there's no perfection in the algorithms. We should all collectively have one algorithm. That's my saying there. But the other one is this, what, what's happened with the, again, the proliferation of the, the concept of NMEC and option C and using the whole building meter, um, imperfect as we've always known and it was, uh, if you're gonna do that, you're gonna need, you need a way to unequivocally and cost-effectively make adjustments when things change that weren't part of the original baseline. Because our method goes back to that simple comparator of simple baseline. The period of time where things used to happen and if things change, you had to make the non-routine adjustment. So um, Evo just came out with a guide and it's the first substantial material attempt by Evo uh, to lay out methods, the range of methods you have to make those adjustments. And there's 10 methods included and it's a damn good document. And we had some really good, uh, like three or 400 people on a series of uh, Evo uh, calls webinars discussing it. So uh, it, it's up for re actually rewriting really quickly because the first one we got out of the shoots and I think can use some improvement, still tightening up with the terminology. <clears throat> but this is way of head and shoulders above any guidance we had before. We really didn't have significant guidance and now we do. This should be applicable both to classic MNV and to you know, the, um, the NMEC world and the portfolio uh, and, and population NMEC and the rest of them. So um, definitely go out and look at that, get that document from the EVO website uh, if you're looking at option C and, and having to deal with the, making these adjustments. The next slide. In closing, so yeah, in closing, just gonna say it's still an exciting time to be in m and if, if not most, the most exciting time. The fundamentals still work. Um, the, the, the baseline, the counterfactual baseline, establishing something, getting everyone to agree to that, putting it in a business deal, operating it, that's working pretty well. It's working, um, I guess what we see internationally is that, um, is that people are coming up to speed more quickly. The regions that weren't doing this at all five years ago now, now are doing it. In a, in a pretty darn quick take up. That's also again, these Zoom calls and internet and everything else is influencing just how fast economies around the world can pick this up. But even on these calls last week, I'm hearing people say in Australia, we don't use option C, we use option B all the time. You know, I get it, that's great. It's great that we have that language and they, they're, not, they're not apologizing. They're saying that doesn't work for us. We like these methods. And then, you know, I know immediately what they're talking about. And okay, so you must have to be hanging a lot of meters on sub, sub meters. Yep, we do a lot of sub metering. Great. So we have this language that's working um, and that's, that's fantastic. We have to adjust now to the hourly, the, the fact that we have all this data. So we need better models, um, both the statistics models doing time a week and temperature or whatever you want to call it, gradient boosting machine, get all our smart machine language folks out there with different algorithms. But ultimately we have to standardize on some to have a business around that. And then physics models and simulations, you know, make them accurate, but make them usable, make them that they're cost effective to actually put inputs in and get useful outputs from them. So um, that's that conclusion. Next conclusion page, a little more conclusion. I have a lot of conclusions. Uh, is, uh, the grid's changing quickly and, and M&V has to change with it. So classic M&V has been disrupt, disrupted, but it's still worth learning because again, you might go down to Australia and they are using option A and B and that's cool. And actually we might be influencing next year our legislature or they'll be doing more A and B in the US again. You know, uh, you know if you look at the industry, it's, it's still a big leap from deemed savings or technical resource manuals to at least option A and B. And it's, it's a lot, it's a big improvement. So the global community out there has a strong foundation in using this method. I don't see that changing anytime soon. Um, We'll see what the rapidly changing grid in the in the California is going to be one of the first ones to do it. Hawaii is also you know, experiencing this, and it is Australia. That's probably why they're going to A and B. Um, so that'll that'll push our push our uh, envelope, and we'll have to you know be more adept at adept at Evo at taking the learnings and getting them back out to our our people, our 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 CMVPs and others. So further education and communication is really going to be needed as we go ahead. But it's a really bright future if you're if you're into this and smart. 
because people need you and the energy efficiency needs you. Uh, we're going to lose out to solar and wind if we don't if we don't step up our game. You know, people are going to want to invest in what they know. And I heard that from Jordan last week. There's an international call, and they go, "We really aren't investing in energy efficiency because you can't meter it." You know, that's why we're investing in solar. So in other parts of the world, you know, this is we've got to step up our game if we really want to uh, harvest what we know we can generate. You know, and put it back on the market and get paid for it. So um, that's it. Uh, Fred, I think the next one's just a, a thank you. Yeah, thanks everyone for listening. Yeah, thank you very much, Steve. Uh, really appreciate it. I do want to open it up to to questions now. I've had a couple trickle in while you were talking, so I'll I'll get started with those. And uh, in the meantime, everyone else, um, feel free to to chat additional questions to me uh, in in the Zoom window. So the first question I got was, I think it was related to the, where, where, where you showed the map of uh, the live spot prices. Um, and the question was how, how or when do you think will price volatility ever show up in rates? You know, I really, really, what, what angers me about that question is I've had that question for years now and I've tried to find the right person to ask it. So and you see it on the, on the Cal ISO website and it shows negative prices. And I go, when are we gonna see that? Or when could I go out and plug, you know, take a van down to the um, Central Valley next to where all those solar plants are, where that's the first one that always comes up, and and with filled with batteries and plug it in and get paid, you know, when can I when can I start taking Tesla batteries across the state and find that, that negative price and get paid to, to plug in, um, you know, as a retail customer, so to speak. And I don't know, I don't know the answer to that yet. I, I don't know if it's just a price signal. I don't know how it's being implemented in terms of, of you know, getting paid to do that. But I, I know that there are people that do know that. I just haven't bothered to gotten through to them, you know. Um, the, st the storage, I mean, there's a whole series of conferences just on storage now, right? There's people that their whole career, they don't do M&B, they just do storage. And they're figuring, they figure that out somehow. But I don't know what their contracts look like or how they react to real time. Uh, another one here. Um... Have you seen any good methods for valuing resiliency and microgrids that provide backup power? You know, valuing, no. I mean, I'll just say the top of my head. Um, what are the um, more la la labyrinthian, what are the more complicated calculations they do at the Public Utility Commission is the avoided cost calculation and the TRC and all that. And I, I, you know, I mentioned earlier, I worked for Enron and uh, you know, whatever you think of the private sector, versus regulated. Um, one thing that still like just blows my mind is the speed with which the private sector can assign a value to something to markets, right? And say, we're gonna leave it open. We're gonna let it float. We're gonna see what people are willing to pay. And we'll assign a value once we see what people are willing to pay. We're not gonna try and articulate this through massive you know, research projects with, here's what a kilowatt hour is gonna be worth in 2035 at 2 PM through some mechanism, which is immediately irrelevant because of all the things that are changing, right? I mean, I love, I love the guys over at E3 that do that for a living and, and generate all those avoided costs and, you know, there's proceedings on it. Um, again, all these, all these are ways of saying what's the value onto the grid of not participating in the grid. And, um, you know, I think regula regulatory means of arriving at that number are fraught. <laughs> That's been my experience. I wish, I wish a firm like Enron was inv involved. You'd be really surprised how quickly they can come up with an answer that works to get the job done, you know, if, if there was a more private sector involved. And frankly, that's, you know, that's kind of what the firms like Recurve are really pushing, which is, you know, this billion dollars a year we've been investing in California in the economy. Yeah, it's been great for a lot of us to have jobs in an ecosystem, you know, that, that worked pretty well. But is that really going to work to get what we need to get done? You know, the climate change, the grid, the grid transformation, all this stuff happening. I, I think not. You know, I think the model that we've got right now is not going to survive five years. All right, this this next question uh, is in regards to energy storage systems. Uh, so the question is, for energy storage system demand savings guarantees, should the building baseline KW load be considered the baseline? Um, the energy services company should be able to make a baseline adjustment whenever the system did not release the battery because the building electrical load did not surpass the triggering point to discharge. Um, so I'm not sure, I may have kind of 
butchered that question, but but maybe uh, as a, as a, generally speaking, uh, Steve, in terms of you know guarantees related to demand savings from storage systems, if you want to speak to that. Yeah, not not um, again. That's one of the challenges to M and V, and so that my immediate reaction would be, I'd want to see the contract. You know, I'd want to see what was what, what did you sign up for, and who's involved. And of course, I don't know if that was in California, what the demand charge structure was and who, you know, you'd have to play off against what that customer, again, if it's what would have happened, you had a, um, and this is back where, you know, Nick, again, I'm looking, I'm looking at you, man, on simulation and did you put that tariff structure in that model? And you don't have to build a sophisticated model. You can, you can sort of squeeze the model in, that roughly matches the load shape ahead of time. And then you can play all kinds of games to that model uh, with rate structures to show if you did different things, what would happen to your cost? Once you've got the rate structure in, in, in there, including demand charges, you can play games and you can actually throw storage in as well. So I guess that's my answer is I would want to build, have a model available and call Nick and get on the eQuest users group uh, so you can simulate those changes and then line that up against your contract. What were they expecting to pay? And, um, and when, when is that, um, you know, whether it's PV or storage, right? Either, either of these influencing the behind the meter, um, you know, that's, that's what you're worried about, right? You can, same thing with the PV system, right? Is that pumping electrons in that are reducing load? Is the meter seeing that? And you're going to need to you're going to need to see the contract and what what tariff you're on to calculate that. Hey, I think I can add on a little bit to that too, uh, Steve. Um, for everyone's benefit too, I think um, I'll I'll start by just quickly echoing some uh, some things that uh, Steve brought up a couple of times in his presentation. Um, you know, the same feelings you have, Steve, you know, I'm, I'm one of the next generation coming in and trying to build on giants like yourself, who've uh, helped to put this body of knowledge together for us to use as a toolkit. And, you know, for myself, I, I fell into IPMVP and AEE kind of sideways from a related side of the industry and uh, found it to be a extremely helpful mid-career um, resource to build a vocabulary of concepts and ways of explaining concepts I was intuiting on my own and trying to figure out. And I would say that um, just as you were getting to in your conclusions, uh, this, this whole body of work that's still getting worked on um, is absolutely fundamental to making the kinds of challenges you're describing around moving baselines and stuff not look like something so hard I can't climb that wall. This is a problem I can solve. I can, I can tackle that. I, I have the tools in my toolkit to adjust a model to, to adjust the way I do valuation. Um, and um, I mean, I guess I can, I can credit Steve and his, and the, the broader team at large working on this stuff over time is making this stuff kind of easy. So it's, it's, it's a solvable problem, you know? So thank you, Steve, for that. Thank you for your presentation. And um, yeah, I think uh, just as you were alluding to there in this, in this response, you know, when, um, when stuff comes up, whether it's negative uh, rates or you know whatever, I mean, we can. The 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 cool thing about what and it's not Equest specifically, but any energy no. platform you you uh, pick up on, um, once you, that that again is a language, right? It's like choosing a coding language. Any coding language is the right one to start with. Um, once you get conversant in any one of those things, you're now dangerous to to work on <laughs> any of them. And um, I would say that. Uh, you know, you can you you can approach um, problems that haven't been solved that are just they're not on the they're not on the books they're not in a standard, and you'll you'll have in combination between what you get from IPMVP what you get from a modeling skill set, there's the the limit is your creativity, um, and so at that point you know we we end up I and others like on this call, you know I'll call up Ben Johnson I I help pull him into this meeting too once I heard about it. You know, he leads a team of between 20 and 30 energy engineers that do eQuests all day, every day to execute and on performance contracting jobs. And we're all the time making up new solutions to problems that haven't happened before. And it's a, it's a really fun place to be in between 10 years from now when there's a standard that makes this all easy. You know, we're here figuring out solutions and that's that's part of, that makes it fun makes it a really interesting industry to be in so anyway that's a little soapbox there but thanks again steve for for this uh presentation for sure when we say that again thanks nick. nick i really appreciate appreciate that i just want to add to that the um on the one hand 
Yeah, you're exactly right. And that's the, that's the creative part, right? What, where, what other industry can you actually be creating? Um, when I teach the CMVP, I say, it's not likely that you're gonna be conversant in every aspect of MNV. Any, anyone getting a CMVP, some of you are really good in the field. And some of you are really good with statistics modeling and some of you are really good with what Nick's good with. And really it is a team effort. You know, that's the other thing. You, you pretty much need to have people with all these skills, range of skills available to you to do this well now. And then the second part is we still have to convince regulators, legislators, and others that we're real. That just because we have flexibility doesn't mean we're making up smoke and mirrors. These are good, solid techniques. And we collectively have to agree that they all work and not abuse them. So that's that's another part. Steve, here's a, here's a question related to lighting. Um... So soon LED lighting applications are gonna be pretty universal, uh, including tunable LEDs with adjustable voltage wattage. Um, I think traditionally lighting, we think of as an option A type of measure. How do you think option A auditing and pre-measurements will have to change due to this and how do we prepare for that? Right, so that's a fantastic one from a, from a 25 year standpoint. When I got started in this industry, we had incandescent lamps and we had magnetic ballasts at Lawrence Berkeley Lab. We were the first uh, facility that I knew of at the time in the US that actually went full on to electronic ballasts, right? So watching, what I'm hearing here is a story of continuous change in the assets, the hardware that generates the, um, you know, the lumens, <laughs> um, I have on my desk here, um, to, to, to accomplish this thing, we want light in our buildings. That's the same with heat and to some degree with heat pumps now and high efficiency heat pumps, the technology changes over time. So yeah, what 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 um, in the, in the general world of of M and V, that stable baseline um, had had two parts. And we used to teach this way. We don't anymore. I don't know why. But there's this, roughly speaking, there's this performance indicator, and there's an operational characteristic. And you and with lighting, we always had just the performance indicator. There was a watts you know watts before or lumens per watt for that system, and then afterwards. And then when you put it in, it ran with some lighting degradation, but you could count on turning the, lot, the switch on and where I had hundred watts before with my old ballast and lamp, now I had 42 and that was the equation. Now I, all I had to do is multiply by operating hours and that was gonna be stable. So the performance itself was stable. The same could have been said for some motors and some things, some miles per gallon, so to speak. And then the operation came in, well, how do you turn it? How often do you turn it on and off and how do you control it? Well, yeah, option A used to be, still is for those types of systems. But like you're saying, lighting is now getting to where both of those functions are changing over time. So, you know, that's option B, right? It's just, if you're, if, if indeed the systems are so sophisticated, like they probably are, you've probably got some sort of IOT on them and you can collect that signal back like with VFDs and chillers and everything else. So fortunately it's easier to run option B now. You don't have to hang your own metering in many cases. I'm not saying LED has that, but it wouldn't surprise me if they are self metered now and have some of that data. So you just set your baseline before and then, you know, understand you're going to be measuring continuously probably in the, in the future period. All right, last last two questions here. Um, all right, so you had mentioned prototypes in your presentation. Uh, are, are these a good way to benchmark a building with accuracy and where could we get access to those prototypes? So um, I, might, I might tip it over to, to Nick or to the eQuest line or the DOE or IBIPSA. IBIPSA is a great place to look. The numerous resource or that Cal BEM. And the whole thing about a prototype is it's, it's a model in, in its best case that reflects um, a, a, an agreed upon average of that, in, in the case of California and the deer modeling prototypes, you know, climate, uh, vintage, climate zone and a building type of, among certain categories. So you take how many thousand buildings in California, it's like several hundred thousand and you boil it down into you know, 50 or 100 or 179, I forget the total number. For each climate zone, you have so many types of hospitals, blah, blah, blah. So if you're building, the whole point of that is you get a building that's pretty close to the average of that type of building in your area. And then that's, that's a really useful tool, uh, first order to identify um, in general, like if I have a, 70, a vintage building that was built in the 70s, it was under a different code compliance regime. It's probably this type of equipment. It probably has this type of heating, ventilating equipment. Then if I do a lighting retrofit, I can quickly do a calculation to assess what the interactive effects would be in general. So when you talk about accuracy, that's tougher. We try and take a prototype and I used to use the analogy of an ingot, 
like an aluminum ingot that you would then pound a few times so it looked more like your building, right? You take a prototype and you change the system list a little bit. That's still possible. I mean, I'm seeing Nick kind of laugh and uh, I don't know functionally if that's actually worked out where the, the foundries are there to take the uh, prototype ingots and mold them into real buildings that are accurate for your building. That's still pretty much an art, I think. But the prototypes are really good. Um, as Nick just said, once you have a large community of people that are comfortable with it, they do a back of the envelope calculation really quickly. Uh, for instance, uh, we built the state of California paid for this under pure or or pure funding was one of these, you know, Sonoma County has prototypes for all their buildings. And um, they did a, a countywide assessment of all the energy and, and built it up on, on the back of all the prototypes and operating hours. So they could say for the entire county, how that building, you know, what retrofits would be most effective for that building stock. Really useful application. Uh, we tried to push that through um, Fresno and other places as well. Again, with some coordination, that'll be the future. Every building will have a model and you'll be able, and you won't need prototypes. They'll be uh, quickly adapted to your specific needs. So um, that's coming. Um, and again, Nick, maybe you can speak to what, how do you get an accurate model quickly out of a prototype? All right, and then finally, uh, last question here, um, Steve, with carbon becoming more and more important and more of a focus, how do you see IP MVP being used for calculated carbon savings? Sure, it's funny. So we used to talk about um, the, uh, the curve. Um, oh man, it's around the tip of my tongue. San Diego is, it even has its own Twitter feed, 400 parts per million. Um, what's the guy's curve? What's the, name, what's the guy's name? For that the number of parts per million carbon in the, in the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. I don't know. Uh, it'll come to me. My my old age. Okay, here's the deal. It was it was it was 380, 395 when I started teaching this class in in um, CMVP class down in Australia in um, 2012. And I said this is the ultimate option C, right? The measurement of carbon in our atmosphere is our ultimate option C. It's one measurement that's doing this right now. It's going up, and we want it to go down. Right? And so in some weird function, all of our work is a part of that vast enterprise that we're all trying to do to turn carbon around, uh, whether through reduction, conservation, and efficiency, and all of this stuff. So, um, you know, what it's going to require if we get serious about it, and we being the entire globe, is methods to, you know, link up all our underlying activities um, to that ultimate, you know, option C goal of reducing carbon, which is measurable keeling, the keeling curve healing curve, top of Mauna Loa in Hawaii, measuring, it's way over 400 now, man. It's still going up as predicted, right? Say what you want about what that carbon density and you know means in terms of warming, warming function, climate change, all that's up for grabs scientifically. There's no question the carbon's going up, right? The measurements are really clear. And if you take that, you say how much we're emitting, it looks like they line up pretty close, all our carbon emissions. So yeah, it looks like the energy sector is a big driver and uh, we have to play our part. And that's just got to get through all the decision makers that you know influence this like billion dollars a year in utility programs. Where do we focus that? Um, where's the value? It's it's going to be a fascinating transition for everybody. I mean, fortunately, you know, it looks like solar is actually doing a lot better, and, and some of these carbon free, carbon neutral, are doing really well. At least for the next five or ten years, though, that whole thing with the duck curve becomes more important. Like, solar is great. What happens when we turn everything back on? For that matter, what happens when we have forest fires like we had this year? That was the greatest carbon emitter we've had, right? And uh, there's a lot of complications there that we have to all think about. But fortunately, everything we do incrementally is in the right direction, right? Um, we save energy, generally we're doing the right thing. So you know, should all pat yourselves on the back. And um, I, I appreciate all of you being here to do the work you do, yeah. Well, yeah, and, and thank you, Steve. I, th I think with that, we'll, we'll wrap up. So once again, uh, thank you so much, Steve, for doing the presentation. We really appreciate it. Uh, this was great.